but no. Hi everyone, we're just going to wait a few more minutes. I know we're kicking off uh, and it's right on too. Thank you for joining us, but we will just wait till we have a few more people to formally kick off. Thanks for those that are still coming in. We're just gonna wait a few more minutes just to let those that might be running a little bit late to join us and not miss out on all of the action. Hopefully both of you have got a glass of water with all of the talking you're about to do. Me too. For those that have just joined us, we're just going to wait a couple more minutes and then we'll kick off. All right, we may as well kick off and those that are coming in to join us later will join us as they can. Before we actually start, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands we're all meeting on today and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm actually in Wollongong on Wadi Wadi country. It is a beautiful day here and I've only been living on this country for about 18 months and I feel very privileged to live here. I'd also like to extend that acknowledgement to everybody else that is actually uh, joining us today. We are all standing on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander country. We always have been and always will be. And I think it's particularly important during Reconciliation Week to acknowledge the country that we walk on and the custodians that are actually here today caring for this country, but also the ancestors that cared for this country before us. So I just wanna thank you all. And if you don't know what country you're on, I encourage you to actually have a look at the IATSIS map. It is certainly something that I think everybody should know on the country, to know the country that they live and work on. So thank you. Obviously, uh, you all know why we're here. We are here for a couple of reasons. We're here because this is National Reconciliation Week, the theme being in this together. And I think at this time in particular, it's really significant to think about in this together. We've all been watching the news and it is something that I'm sure is going to come up today. But also wanna recognise that today is Mabo Day. So it, this is a, a very significant day for multiple reasons. And I, for those that don't know me, I should actually introduce myself. My name's Summer Mae Finlay. I'm a Yorta Yorta woman and I'll be moderating this uh, webinar today. I actually am really lucky to be at the University of Canberra with Uncle Tom there. So technically he's my big boss. Um, but I also am a lecturer at the University of Wollongong. And with the Public Health Association of Australia, I am the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Vice President, and I feel very lucky to be able to be here today with Fiona Stanley and Tom Kalmer. And thank you to those people that are actually sharing with us what country they're on. I can see that we've got people from around the country, so that's fantastic. So today we've got a webinar where we're actually going to have um, Tom Kalmer and also Fiona Stanley present to us and then there'll be time for questions. We do encourage you to use the, the Q&A section for your questions. That will be the easiest way to make sure that we don't miss your questions because we do want to make sure we cover them. We are expecting a large number of people today, so I apologise if we do not get to your question, but we will do our very best to make sure we answer them as much as we can. Now, I am going to actually uh, introduce the two panellists and then we're going to have a couple of videos before they speak. So, of course, we have Professor Tom Kalmer, 
who I have indicated is my big boss at the University of Canberra. He is the Chancellor there. He is also the Poach Patron and Chair. He is a long time advocate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and has worked tirelessly for a number of years, both inside government and outside government. And I feel very lucky to know him and I think that you will find his presentation enlightening. He always is. We also have Professor Fiona Stanley. Fiona established the what is now known as the Telethon Kids Institute. She was the founding director. She has been working in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research since the 1970s and is a committed ally and accomplice who has been leading the way in training Indigenous researchers because it's her belief that unless we have Indigenous researchers, we're not going to make a significant impact. So I'm going to leave both of the panellists to introduce themselves in full later, if that's okay. But before we do hear from both the panellists, we have a video from Minister Wyatt. So for those of you that don't know Minister Wyatt, he is the first minister, first Aboriginal minister in this country. He was the, formerly the Minister for Indigenous Health and is now the Minister for Indigenous Australians and the first Aboriginal minister for Indigenous Australians. So we'll just play that video. I want to acknowledge all Indigenous Australians, and in particular the Wadjuk people on whose land I'm now sitting. I want to acknowledge our Elders past and present. But equally, I want to acknowledge the Public Health Association of Australia for your contribution to the journey that we take together in addressing the many issues that are gaps within Aboriginal society. Reconciliation Week. I think we've just had a freeze in the screen. Ellie, maybe we pause the video and try it, just click on it again. If that doesn't work, we might just move on. We might actually try and play that video at the end uh, afterwards. And if we don't actually have much success with that, what we'll actually do is, because it's really important to hear from our minister, we'll pop that up on YouTube and can share that link. I'm sure Minister Wyatt won't mind. Um, we are going to attempt now to play Linda Burney's video. Let's see if we have much more success with that. If we have the same problem, we will do the same thing. So for those that don't know, Linda Burney is the member, member for Barton. She is also the Shadow Minister for Social Services and for Indigenous Affairs. We're having some issues with that volume, Ellie. Technology is not on our side today. So what we're going to do is park the videos while we sort out our technical difficulties and we might go straight to the panellists if that's okay. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Uncle Tom Kalmer. Um, thank you, Summer. And uh, uh, can I begin by acknowledging uh, that I'm on the land of the Ngunnawal people in Canberra and pay respects to elders past and present and particularly uh, recognise their youth as we should with, with all youth who are going to be our future leaders, the custodians of our stories, our cultures, our histories, our languages. And, and really that's what reconciliation in part is all about. Um, can I thank the PHAA for, for hosting this event and on this very auspicious day which is seeing the, the end of National Reconciliation Week and and also recognise not only um, uh, Summer, but uh, my panel, uh, fellow panellist, uh, Dr. Fiona, Professor Fiona Stanley. Um, look, uh, I think the PHAA needs to be recognised, and, and I know there's going to be many members of PHAA tuning in today, but there's going to also be a lot of others. But I'd encourage you to have a look at the, uh, the publication that's going to be shared with you shortly, but also on the PHA website, which which will really highlight, uh, you know, all those submissions and, and all the effort that PHAA goes to every year to particularly advance Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander affairs. And, and um, you know, and, and I 
acknowledge and, and uh, congratulate them on taking the initiative many years ago now of creating the um, Vice President uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander position. And we've seen some great people holding that, um, including young Summer now, um, soon to be Dr. Uh, Summer Finlay. Uh, look, my, my role, uh, I'm also actually co-chair of Reconciliation Australia, but I've stepped down from that role for, for 12 months while I've taken on the, the, the role with uh, Marcia Langton as being co-chair of the senior advisory group to the voice to government or parliament and um but have been involved with indigenous affairs for a long time and and my mob are actually from darwin uh Kungarikan on my mother's side and iwaja on my father's side um now reconciliation i think you know and and i want to just talk a little bit about reconciliation first and and then some of the the key issues around it and i guess from an ra position uh, our vision is for a just equitable and reconciled Australia. And so all the efforts that we do uh, is to try and advance that. We say that there are five dimensions of reconciliation. I won't go through all of them today, but I'll touch on, on a number of them. And you, you probably know it, uh, know them, but uh, race relations is, is one, of the, one of the key um, dimensions that we look at. Also, equality and equity, um, institutional integrity, historical acceptance, and, and, uh, and unity, and how do we bring each other together. But it's also worth remembering that when we talk about reconciliation, it's not about Aboriginal trust on the people reconciling with the major population. It's about the general population reconciling with Aboriginal trust on the people because we are the first inhabitants of this country. Uh, we are the longest continuing surviving culture in the world. And yet um, the social, economic, health conditions that we experience are some of the worst in the world. And so that's a real dilemma for all of us, but uh, that's what we, we bring this uh, uh, to you today to talk a bit about. Uh, what we know is that in the work that RA's been doing is that the general population is getting more and more disposed to supporting and recognising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And we're seeing over 90% of First Nations people and, and, um, and the same for, for non-Indigenous Australians who believe that we as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people should have a say in our own affairs, which is you know, a big move from the time that we were totally controlled um, and you know, to, to even be able to access our land or leave our lands and so forth. Um, but also really interesting um, is that the majority of people really um, believe that we should remove the racial clauses of the constitution and that we should address racism. Uh, sometimes you've got to question, well, who are the other, is it the other minority, vast minority, who are perpetrating all this uh, racism and discrimination? But for us in the health sector, it's, that's our big challenge in, in making sure that we address uh, racism, we address uh, institutional uh, discrimination and racism, and we really check out our unconscious bias. So I think that's... Uh, uh, you know, really, really important. Um, we have the reconciliation action plans, and again, um, PHAA have have one, have had one for a couple of years. Uh, they join over over fifteen hundred other uh, Aboriginal organisations who have got uh, wraps, and and over five thousand schools and early childhood centres. So you know, we, we're getting a whole whole movement in Australia looking at, at reconciliation and and what we do. And we know that RAP organisations, people in them have better attitudes towards uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. They're more willing to get involved. They partner, they purchase um, goods from Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, and they invest a lot in, in um, you know, scholarships for, for our people. But also, I think what's important is that many of them, and this gets back to our institutional integrity and, and um, uh, and addressing cultural bias and unconscious bias is that in the last survey that we did over 1800 people uh, had done face-to-face -face or on learning cultural um, uh, learning packages and so you know that's boding really well. I wanted to mention a couple of things for those who may not really reflect on them because people think that Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander movement is something new. It is not new, it's been around for a long time and um, you know, from the 30s and, and the big movements in Victoria and so forth. But 
some of the ones you might recall is that, well, that's disgusting that, sorry. Um, what well, was was back in the beginning of the land rights movement with the Yurikala petition in 63, the freedom, freedom rides led by Charlie Perkins to address racism uh, that existed in, in 65. The 1967 referendum that recognised us in the constitution. Um, you know, um, the Barunga statement, which, which really, uh, that was 1988. And um, you know, the, 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 the petition that we saw uh, from that and really pushing governments and, and, um, and that was at the Hawke time uh, as prime minister to, to recognize Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and to, to recognize that we should be enjoying the same rights as everybody. You know, the, the basic universal declaration of human rights um, brings us certain rights. The, the, the various international covenants, uh, the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination and so forth. And when you have a look at that petition, it talks about issues uh, around you know, food security, housing, um, medical care was a really big one, health, uh, education, all of the issues. And, and, and so they're not new. We saw in, and, and what we're celebrating today is the anniversary in 1992 of the High Court decision uh, called the Mabo decision to recognise that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were here prior to England proclaiming Australia uh, a colony of England. And so it overturned the doctrine of Terra Nullis, uh, which was you know, really important as part of our, our history. And this is all, all part of that addressing and understanding our history. We've got a greater understanding now and the great work that's happening at a, a Union Newcastle in mapping out all the massacre sites across Australia. Uh, important that we get to understand them. And then, of course, in, in um, 92, we also had uh, Paul Keating's Redfern statement, which, which um, you know, I think is really telling. And I want to uh, just read uh, some parts of it. Uh, he goes on to say in 92, and as I say, the starting point uh, might be to recognise that the problem starts with us, non-Aboriginal Australians. It begins, I think, with an act of reconciliation. Uh, an act of recognition. And it needs to be recognised that it was we who did the disposing. We took the traditional lands and smashed the traditional way of life. We bought the disaster, the alcohol. We committed the murders. We took the children from their mothers. We practised discrimination and exclusion. It is our ignorance and our prejudice and our failing to imagine these things being done to us. And, and, and uh, you know, very telling. We fail to imagine uh, are these things done to us and what would our reaction be? With some noble uh, uh, exceptions, we fail to make the basic, most basic human response and enter into their hearts and minds. We fail to ask, how would I feel if this was done to me? You know, worth having a read of, as is the Uluru Statement, which I won't go into because I know Fiona will talk more about this, but another great document to have a, have a read of. So why, why are we here this National Reconciliation Week? The theme is all around in this together, how we as a society have to work together to uh, resolve the issues. As a population group, we are 3% Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, the majority, of course, are non-Indigenous Australians. And that's why you've got to reconcile with us and why we've got to do this together in whatever movement. We're not the perpetrators. Uh, of the massive uh, racism or discrimination against uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So uh, 20 years on, we're celebrating um, the bridge walks, the walk across Sydney Harbour Bridge um, in, in the year 2000, where over 250,000 Australians walked in, in support of reconciliation. And, um, you know, and we know, and I, I mentioned, you know, the number of, of um, Australians now 90 plus percent who, who want to support reconciliation. And interestingly, interestingly, is that 80% of the non-Indigenous Australians believe that we should have uh, truth telling um, and, and understand that process so we understand our, our history. So politicians, get on board, understand what your constituents are saying um, in, in this movement, which is, which is important. So anyhow, I, I, I I think we've got to look at when we come to health, uh, some of those impacts. Colonisation, really big impact. Fiona will talk a bit more about that. 
but we need governments to start to implement some of the policies that many of us have worked on, um, including uh, politicians have worked on uh, through their Senate and House of Reps uh, and um, you know, uh, uh, all the Royal Commission reports and so forth on every aspect of, of Indigenous affairs. We need to do it. One of the ones that I'm really keen on seeing the government um, look at is what they approved uh, a number of years ago now, 20, 2017, I think. Um, it was a, all the health ministers agreed on a social and emotional wellbeing framework. And if, if we, you know, we spend all the time in doing these reports, talking to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, talking to the general population on what needs to be done, it gets done and then it just sits some, in some cupboard somewhere and never ever gets implemented. So implementation is probably one of our big failings in uh, public policy in Australia. But when we get around to talking about health, and if I could have that slide up um, while I talk, um, and, and, uh, and you'll see we, we, there's a whole lot of movement. Uh, right now we've got the coalition of Indigenous peaks who are looking at uh, the closing the gap targets. And uh, um, okay, if you can click it again. Well, I can't read it, it's too small. Um, but anyhow, we, we've got a coalition of peaks working on developing new closing the gap targets, which is going to be so important, but we've had targets before. It's the way that it's implemented and, and we've got to take, you know, prime ministers of the past and, and the current prime minister who said he wants to work with us and listen to us, hear us, create the voice that we can all, all um, you know, express a view um, in parliament. And so I wanted to just touch on, on this aspect, and that is um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan, which has been in existence for a number of years now. And that was developed up in a co-design process with the National Health Leadership Forum, which are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peak bodies. Uh, and, and we've had an implementation plan. We're now reviewing that plan for the next iteration. And uh, Donna Murray, the head of IHA, um, she chairs that. I, I'm deputy chair and, um, uh, you know, but what we're trying to do is to bring uh, a social and cultural determinist lens to health policy. And uh, the, the uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's very small, the print there, so, so very difficult to see. But and if you are able to see it, what we're saying is that if you look at the whole life journey from pre-birth through to death, we need to have different approaches uh, across the nation uh, to be able to address these issues. Um, because circumstances vary, um, depending on location, depending on, on socioeconomic um, status and so forth, access to, to services. Uh, but central to all of this is culture in, in what we do. And, and from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, person's point of view, when we talk about health, we're talking about um, the whole body, uh, the mind, the body, uh, the external relationship with land and culture. So. They're all critically important when we, when we look at health. And I really urge, um, you know, PHAA members, uh, if you haven't got on board, uh, understand what social and cultural determinants are, you know, participate in, in um, uh, you know, a cultural awareness, cultural competency training package, and there's plenty around, um, you know, because I think they're critically important. Uh, and what, what you might want to also consider, and I won't go on too much, uh, on the health side of it, because we'll pick some of that up in, in questions, I'm sure. But I'll close with, with two things. One was the importance of the 2008 National Apology to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and particularly those from the stolen generation, and the very cathartic effect that had on people's health and well-being, knowing that, um, uh, that you know, governments have finally um, expressed an apology. Uh, we also saw in 2016, um, uh, the Australian uh, Psychological Society, that's all the psychs and, uh, you know, across the nation and, and um, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, all, all uh, doing a national apology as well. And, uh, and they apologise for the harm that their discipline, their workers over the past have, have done uh, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And, and I think that was a, a very important one. That was also led uh, by uh, Professor Pat Dudgeon, a uh, Bardi woman over there in Perth. And, um, and, and, and Pat is also leading a lot on the, not only social emotional wellbeing, but 
uh, on suicide prevention, which is also a major scourge on, on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's uh, well-being. But also in Perth, in 2018, we saw the Commissioner of Police uh, make a formal apology uh, to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, or the Aboriginal people uh, principally in West Australia, about the harm that, that the police had inflicted and the contribution they may have made, they may have made uh, in, in the way that they practice uh, that has impacted on Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. Two very important apologies uh, uh, to get across and I'd urge PHA to think about you know, what they can do as a, as a peak body to, to also stand up and, and consider uh, the, you know, uh, what, what your workers may have contributed to over the years, uh, your members, uh, to, to the welfare of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. And, and you know, it's, you're doing a great job, but I think there's always more to do. And that, that recognition, I think, is important. And also what Chris Dawson, the commissioner in, in West Australia, talked about, and we talk about a lot now, is unconscious bias. And, and, and how do we formulate our own opinions? Is it based on what we see on the, on the television? Um, is it what we hear from the shock jocks who will give a distorted story of, of what um, is happening in society? You know, we, we, there, there are lessons to learn about what's happening in the US at the moment. And, and, and that all gets around to what, what Terry Slavin's um, uh, you know, pet project is at the moment, and that's on preventive health. You know, which we all should be looking at because prevention is really uh, the catalyst of, of a better, healthier future. And, uh, and I think the lessons we can learn from what's happening in the US where issues aren't being addressed in, in the incarceration and the justice areas, and there's been so many reports done over here uh, on those same issues, and that just haven't been implemented, the recommendations, and what we can learn from COVID-19 and how Aboriginal trusted on the people have been so fortunate that less than 60 of us have been affected and, and as I understand it, nobody has, has um, died from COVID-19. But we had the prevention uh, practices put in place early and, and that's what, uh, what saved us, when, particularly when you compare it to Indigenous peoples around the world. So look, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'm sure Fiona will, um, will pick up on, on those two topics that I mentioned that she would. And, um, and all the best and keep those questions firing. And good day, Ellie Taylor. Thanks, Thank you. Sorry. Fiona, I'll just kick over straight to you. Thanks very much, Summer. And uh, Tom, you're an absolute legend and it's just such an honour for me to be on the program with you. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge that I'm actually on Wiradjuri country here in Victoria and acknowledge always the impact that colonisation has had on people in Australia, that's the best way we can acknowledge that as well as acknowledging leaders. I want to, uh, as quickly as I can, um, go through two major issues. Uh, the first is to touch on the pandemic that Tom's already mentioned and the First Nation response to the pandemic. Um, we actually have had only 59 cases amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, First Nations, um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, that's 0.7% of all cases nationally. If it, you think about 3% of the population being uh, First Nations, we should have had 215 cases. The gap has been reversed. Um, First Nations are doing better than non-First Nations. There have been 13% um, hospitalizations, none in intensive care, and as Tom said, no deaths. Why? Because Aboriginal people, the First Nations people, took the power. We gave them the power. And once we had given them the power, they then swung into action earlier than almost anyone. They lobbied the national state government, the federal government to bring in the Biosecurity Act to close remote communities. Not one case in a remote community. The vast majority of cases are in urban centres. Only seven are in regional centres and none in, in the remote or very remote communities. It's an extraordinary success story. And it's because the whole campaign to prevent COVID-19 in this very vulnerable population was run by an Aboriginal leadership, which knew exactly what to do from Mark Winnetong, Adrian Carson, the people in uh, Leslie Nelson and uh, uh, Sandra Eads and Francine Eads in West Australia, all around the nation, got partnerships going, task forces set up, and basically they controlled how this epidemic um, panned out for um, First Nations. And, and it's been the most remarkable success story. 
What does that mean? It means when power is given to uh, First Nations, they know what to do. So I want to talk now about a little bit about the Uluru Statement. And I want to start because if ever there was evidence that a voice was going to work, it's the pandemic. And I want to just give you a quote um, from uh, Galway Yunipingu. So I, I want you to read the Uluru Statement, but this is a quote from him. So get ready with your tissues because it's very emotional. What Aboriginal people ask is that the modern world now makes the sacrifices necessary to give us a real future, to relax its grip on us, to let us breathe, to let us be free of the determined control exerted on us to make us like you. And you should take that a step further and recognise us for who we are <clears throat> and not who you want us to be. Let us be who we are, Aboriginal people in a modern world and be proud of us. Acknowledge that we have survived the worst that the past at us has thrown at us. And we are here with our songs, our ceremonies, our land, our language and our people, our full identity. What a gift this is that we can give you if you choose to accept us in a meaningful way. Whoa, that's the reconciliation message. So what does it mean for us as non-First Nations? What, would she, we, what should we be doing as public health professionals to accept this challenge and this wonderful gift that Unipingu's offered us? The, the first is you have to read the Uluru Statement. It's in the back of the document that PHA is gonna to send to you today. Um, and the first thing I think is to listen to First Nations. You don't have the answers, they do. I've had to learn this, I've been paternalistic, I've talked too much, I haven't taken that on board. The next thing is to educate yourself. Um, as Tom said, the history and the impact of colonization. Could we have the slide now, please, Ellie? That would be great. Um, and so the impact of colonization, um, which is shown here, um, we've taken children away, we've taken land away, we've taken the uh, hunter-gatherer lifestyle, the loss of culture, we've put people on fringes away and, and in our urban, marginalized urban centers, we've not been able, we've marginalized people and discriminated, They've got poor nutrition, poor living conditions, overcrowding, um, unemployment, poverty, poor education, which leads to all of the outcomes that currently we're focused on to improve the health and well-being of Aboriginal people. I just want to say to you that this isn't an Aboriginal problem. If we had been through this set of circumstances, we would be there with the alcohol and substance abuse. Now, as an old epidemiologist, many years ago, I might have said, oh, look, alcohol and smoking causes you to have a low birth weight baby and all these problems. We know we took your children away, your land away, and we killed you and massacred you. But look, don't smoke or drink, it's bad for your health. That is not the kind of way that a PHAA today would work, I know. Thanks, the slide off now, Ellie. The other way to educate yourself, I think, is to read this fantastic book that Thomas May has just written called The Heart of the Nation. And it's a wonderful understanding of how the Uluru Statement came to be. It's also a wonderful story about Thomas Mayer, who is a, a Torres Strait Islander man, but Larrakia mum and a, and a, and a Galawinku dad, um, who's worked for the Maritime Union of Australia and is now going around with the statement to convince people to support it. Um, the next thing I think you need to do is to prioritise prevention, which is what Terry's doing. And if you think about that, that means you've got to get political. The group of public health professionals in apartheid South Africa worked on getting rid of apartheid because it was the most important thing that was affecting the health and well-being of the total population of South Africa. And that's what they had to do. Many of them got tossed out. And of course, we benefited from getting them here in WA and other places because they weren't uh, acceptable uh, uh, back in uh, apartheid South Africa. I think the other thing is to try and appreciate the impact of the stolen generation on current Aboriginal circumstances with intergenerational trauma. Now, the West Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey <clears throat> in 2003 showed that between 40 and 60% of today's children record a history of forced separation from family and land. 40 to 60% of children statewide. If that's not a stolen generation and cultural genocide, I don't know what is. And you have to understand what that meant. How you now have to walk in two worlds. You have to have your Aboriginal world if you can still get it. 
and to be successful in a dominant culture that doesn't appreciate necessarily the impact of that intergenerational trauma, which is still going on today. I'd like to support Tom's suggestion, go out on country. Go out on country with elders. The wonder of it, the wisdom, the ways of being and doing is just the most sustainable uh, way of, of living in today's world, but it also gives you such a spiritual and peaceful experience. I've been out now on country, particularly with people like Noel Nan up in Western Australia, and it's changed my life, it's changed my appreciation of my whole life. But it also, be, you begin to understand then what has been lost and why it's been so important for Aboriginal people who have lost that in terms of their health and development and well-being. The next recommendation, I'm full of suggestions here, sorry, is to socialise with your Aboriginal colleagues, invite them to dinner, the, have picnics together, go to the pictures, etc. cetera. Um, Tom's been at our place. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, I've got a funny story about that because I had um, one of, I used to have quite a few of our Aboriginal uh, health research meetings at my house and I had to actually leave to go to Canberra and left 12 of the Aboriginal researchers sitting around my dining room table. And I just said, look, just lock the front door when you go, guys. And they said, but we're a bunch of blackfellas. <laughs> we're going to trash your house. <laughs> That's the kind of wonderful relationship that you have. And you will benefit so much from having these Aboriginal colleagues as your friends. I have learned so much. It's changed my whole life. Trust them. I've got another funny story about that. Um, uh, we had a wonderful um, group of Aboriginal researchers through a capacity building grant within HMRC, and then we decided at the end of that we would put in a Centre of Research Excellence grant. And so I said, look, I'll do the first draft because I know what NHMRC funds. They said to me, we don't like it. Let's, can we rewrite it? Trust us. I said, but I know what NHMRC, they said, trust us. I said, okay. They got the top funded NHMRC CRE in the nation. So we all had to go back to my house that night with champagne, and they kept on saying to me, oh, you know what NHMRC funds? And so there you are. Trust Aboriginal people. They know what to do. If there's something I've learned over the years, it's really learn from your Aboriginal colleagues, and then you will succeed in, in working together. Combat racism all the time. It's pervasive. It's there every day with every Aboriginal person I know. It's also, from a public health perspective, a most important cause of illness, death, suicide, not just homicides like we're seeing in uh, um, America. I, I can hardly bear to watch what's happening there. And with Aboriginal health research, the most important thing now, since we have so many talented, highly trained Aboriginal researchers is the Aboriginal person has to be the CIA, the first investigator on every grant, not you. Um, it's, it is absolutely key. Don't fund research in Aboriginal health unless there is an Aboriginal chief investigator as CIA. And I love the idea of PHA of giving honours and awards to Aboriginal people. That's terrific. That's absolutely great. Um, and I think there are lots of things, additional things we can do. But my time is up and I just want to say thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity to vent all this stuff out. I feel better because of it, but it is such an important issue for us. I think probably it is the most important issue for us in Australia, as well as climate change, that we have to address. Um, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for, for Tom, to Tom and also Fiona. Now, we notice we've only got one question in the Q&A section. So while you are getting to type your questions, we are going to have another crack at playing those videos. Uh, if they don't play, we will just skip straight over to the questions. So Ellie, could I just ask you to put up Minister Wyatt's video again, please? I want to acknowledge all Indigenous Australians, and in particular the Wadjuk people on whose land I'm now sitting. I want to acknowledge our Elders past and present. But equally, I want to acknowledge the Public Health Association of Australia for your contribution to the journey that we take together in addressing the many issues that are gaps within Aboriginal society. Reconciliation Week is a particular focus but I want to remind people in your webinar that it goes beyond that and that it is an annual event that focuses all of our attention 
but your association does it all year round. The relationships, the way in which you work with Aboriginal organisations is critical to the public health focus that we need to place over the top of Aboriginal people and communities right across this nation. And for that work, I thank all of the leadership. I thank every member of your association who is working on the frontline work and congratulate you for walking with us. And I look forward to a longer and enduring future. Thank you. It's fantastic to see we had success. Sometimes technology works and when it does, it's brilliant just like that. Uh, if we can play Linda Burney's video as well, that would be brilliant too. While we're pulling up that video, just remind people that down the bottom there is on your screen, there is a Q&A function and it would be fantastic for you to drop your questions in there. I see there's 149 people on. You cannot tell me that there is not one of you that has a question other than uh, the one we have up there now from Ingrid. Ellie, when you're ready for that video. One second. Well, my greetings to the Public Health Association of Australia and thank you so, so much for asking me to be part of uh, your webinar. To Tom and Fiona and Summer, uh, good luck with the panel, I'm sure you'll be absolutely fantastic. The 3rd of June is a very significant day for Australia. Uh, the 3rd of June 1992, the High Court made a decision that just changed the framework for how Australians think and the understanding that they have. Of course, the High Court decision uh, really threw out the legal do doctrine of terra nullius, which was a lie. It recognised for the first time in Australian law that Aboriginal people were the prior occupiers and owners of this country. I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing when the radio announced that the High Court had made this decision. I was driving down City Road, it was in the afternoon, and I just felt this incredible surge of finally the truth is being told. Fantastic. I have to say, uh, Linda was right when she said that uh, Tom Calmer and Fiona Stanley would be fantastic because they absolutely were. So we, I do know we have a couple of questions here and I'm just going to kick off straight into the questions if that's all right with uh, Tom and Fiona. Um, we've got a question here from Colin. How do non-Indigenous public health practitioners move from a mindset of helping Indigenous Australians to working with Indigenous Australians? And I think, Fiona, you touched on this a little bit within your presentation. Yeah, um, but Tom, I prefer if you'd like to start because you're yep. my, my senior and more knowledgeable person. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so, but no, I... Um... <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Fiona. Um, look, I, I think there's a, 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 a quite a number of ways. I mentioned about firstly becoming, uh, doing, you know, a, a cultural awareness or, or development program, uh, firstly, and, and becoming informed about your local environment and, and the people that you're, you're working with and, uh, and particularly uh, the land on whose country that you're, you're uh, developing. We're hoping that you know, Medicos into the future will be much better placed than, than some of the in the past uh, because we now have, um, you know, it, within mandatory curriculum, within uh, medicine training. And, and that will hopefully also expose uh, new doctors to, to a different approach. But first, you know, I think, and, and Fiona picked up on a number of these actually, um, it's about understanding your local environment, asking questions, asking people, um, uh, what 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 they think. Try and uh, address your own unconscious biases about uh, uh, you know who the who the person may may very well be. We hear um, and you know and this is it happens in the in the health profession and and some of it's really come out of um, you know some deaths in custody where where people have had major medical problems uh, that've been incarcerated. People haven't 
believed what they've said about their condition and therefore they've ended up passing. And, um, you know, there's, there's a, hand, uh, a good number of them already that were easy, easy within the last decade. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess from my perspective, it's really listening and hearing and understanding and, and um, you know, and, and participating in events like uh, National Reconciliation Week. Um, and people get to see who you are and, and, um, and they'll have, you know, a much more comfortable relationship. Fantastic. I totally agree, Tom. I think that the, the, the um, person who asked the question, um, it really is um, important that you just ask Aboriginal people that question. If you work with Aboriginal colleagues, take them out and have a great meal together and just say, look, um, I asked this question at the PHA webinar and Fiona Stanley and Tom Carmen said, go and talk to you. So I'm coming to talk to you. What, what do I do? I, I don't want to be paternalistic. And, and often we are. I started off as a little doc, do good a doctor and everything black was good and everything white was bad. Um, that was in the 1970s because I'm very old, older than Tom, aren't I? Anyway, and um, so it, it, it is just so exciting for you to be able to go and have this amazing conversation with people who do have a different perspective and a different lived, a different lived experience, which will change your views and will make you just um, a, a different person. Fantastic. Uh, thank you for both those comments. If I might just uh, add a comment myself, Fiona, you talked about uh, giving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people power. I often tell just not Aboriginal people to get out of the way. Um, because when Good. people do, Good. <laughs> when, <Piss> when, off. <laughs> but we need you there for your support. But as I describe it you know, in theatre terms, because I used to be in theatre, non-Indigenous peoples need to be the backstage crew, and Aboriginal people need Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people need to be the directors, actors, and producers. So, um, Tom, you touched on unconscious bias uh, both in your presentation and just in your last question. We have a question here from Amanda who wants to thank you both for your inspiring presentations. Uh, and she just wants to know if you can point to any of the, re recommend any resources around unconscious bias. <coughs> yeah, well, there's, um, thank you, Amanda. Uh, th there's plenty on the internet uh, to address uh, unconscious bias and where we're going. Um, through, through Pat Dudgeon's Centre on uh, the, the, the Centre for uh, Best Practice in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Suicide Prevention. Um, you know, we address it in, in quite a number of the publications uh, there as well. Um, but, but it's really, um, you know, it's easy to get off the internet and, and, um, uh, and just to understand it's, it's a re how, to, how our attitudes form. Within the Australian Public Service, uh, they've attempted to also um, address it, and uh, and and so that then flowed into participating in cultural awareness, cultural competency training programs um, to do it. But you know, we, we've said, uh, you know, we've said it's about participating in events and and not having the fear factor about Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. But in saying that, look, you know, we can't say that. You know, every member of every population group is is going to be right on board to to be supportive and um, and be willing to to talk and share their stories because sometimes they can be very traumatic, uh, their own experiences, and so we've got to do it with sensitivity as well in in who we interact with. But you know, we've just celebrated in in the ACT uh, Reconciliation Day on Monday, which is a public holiday last Monday, and. Um, you know, it's, it's the, the only jurisdiction that does that, but it's an opportunity there where, where the whole population gets together and, and learns about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We have yarning groups, uh, opportunities for people to just sit down and have a chat. And, um, and, you know, people from all walks of life, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, are really keen to get involved. Um, one of the things I, I didn't mention, I meant to mention before, and uh, the other good case study is looking at what Dr. Noel Harman, uh, Heyman did up in Inala in Queensland in his centre, a mainstream uh, community health centre, uh, by just changing the profile of the centre or having an Aboriginal receptionist or having um, artwork in there made it much more welcoming. Aboriginal clients came in big numbers. And that's um, you know, a, a really good, good example of how you know, just a few small changes and, and some big changes with changing the attitude of doctors um, in the service 
you know, and, and nurses was able to, to really change the way uh, people viewed the service and participated, uh, which is what we want. We want, we want to develop those, those relationships. We don't want, we don't, you know, because for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, one of our big issues um, too often, and not over generalisation a little bit, but um, is that, that there's a fear factor there. People won't present to hospitals for fear or to doctors for fear of finding out something, uh, you know, bad about their health. And so we've got to try and break that down to say, you know, getting in early, getting in prevention uh, are the best ways to have a long, healthy life. Fantastic. Mm. Oh, I just added a little bit to some of that. I don't want to take too much time. Um, there are some things that are really important. One is this, this unconscious bias. We have an unconscious white privilege that, oh. that, that um, we just are not aware of and that it's something we have every day, like Aboriginal people have racism every day. And I think that's important. So you can read a lot about white privilege. There's lots and lots of books on this now. There's one called Why I Have Stopped Talking to White People About Race, um, which is a, a journalist from uh, Jamaica who's British. There's ta -Nehisi Coates, who's the most wonderful writer from uh, America. And, you know, there's, there's this whole lot of stuff that psychologists have done on fast and slow thinking, where you, you, you respond uh, immediately to something with a, an unconscious bias. And racism is like that, just like yes. that. So there's a lot of literature on that. Very good question. Fantastic. Thank you. Now, uh, again, Tom, you talked about suicide in particular. You talked about the work that Pat Dudgeon's done. Um, we actually have a question here from Sue. Sue's just asking a question. Suicide is a major challenge for all Australians with Aboriginal rates at more than twice that of non-Indigenous Australians. How can health services deliver better quality care to those that do present help to health services to help reduce this disparity? Mm. Yeah, you know, if we all knew how, um, you know, we'd be able to do it. I don't think there's one single answer um, to it, but, uh, but part of it, and and look, government policies and, and, and the way they implement some of their programs, um, you know, don't, don't assist in this, in this area. Um, you know, Fiona mentioned the intergenerational trauma. Uh, we don't address that uh, well enough. We don't recognise it as a, as a key contributor, any of the traumas that we experience. And unless we address those issues that um, I mentioned in this, uh, the social and emotional, uh, not social and emotional, um, the social and cultural determinant space, you know, making sure that we've got good housing, we address poverty, we address racism. All of those issues are contributors. But then again, um, you know, there, there's a really good publication um, called the Aboriginal Trust on a Suicide Prevention Evaluation um, uh, Project that, uh, that uh, Pat, Pat led. And, um, and that looks at all the different suicide prevention strategies that exist around the nation. And we've just formed a, a new peak body, an advocacy body uh, called the Gaya Dewey Proud Spirit Australia, uh, Indigenous led, and uh, we'll be working uh, closely. And our first Indigenous psychiatrist, uh, uh, Helen Milroy, uh, she she leads that group. And so, you know, these are these are initiatives taken by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, supported by government, to try and uh, look at and drill down on some of these issues. But until we can get governments to recognise that the way that they go about their business is also contributing um, by the disempowerment, by the continual uh, information like you know, closing down communities or restricting people's uh, ability to be able to um, utilise their own land and, and their own cultural practices and demeaning those sort of uh, practices as not, not being meaningful, uh, all of that contributes to people's wellbeing. And, um, and, you know, some of that will contribute to, to people taking their own life. But, um, yeah, unfortunately, there's no one single answer. But, you know, I, I often use the analogy of you get a few road fatalities and then the government invests billions of dollars in the, the, the you know, the Black Road um, repair program. We, we have more suicides in Australia than we lose people on the roads and yet we get a pittance of money um, presented towards suicide prevention. Yeah, if I can just add, I think that's so fantastic, Tom. I mean, you're indefatigable, all the things that you're involved in, and thank God you're still so passionate and fantastic. Um, I think this um, issue is huge, and it's multifactorial and intergenerational, all those things that Tom mentioned. But there are some Aboriginal leaders in this, Pat's one, 
uh, and absolutely superb, again, a West Australian, um, and Michael Wright, who yeah. went and said, um, what's, he asked Aboriginal people for his PhD, which he did with us, um, why don't you use mainstream health services? These are people with significant mental illness in the high-risk regions of metropolitan Perth. And what he's then done is brought a Noongar worldview into mainstream health services um, for psychiatric treatment. And it's just been an extraordinary journey for these service providers, both government and non-government. Um, I think the power of culture is hugely important and we need to address that with kids who are coming out of pension or coming out of prison and then have high risk for suicide. But culture, what, what we can do with culture, and there are a lot of interesting programs now, which I think are being trialled around the nation. The other thing that was devastating to us, and you think of those causal pathways in that diagram of colonisation I showed, was the defunding of 70 Aboriginal controlled early childhood services around the nation. These were much more than providing childcare. These were language, culture, employment for mothers, engagement of families, domestic violence stuff. These were June Oscars program in the Fitzroy Valley. And um, it, it meant the children were ready for school. It set them on a pathway to success in a dominant culture rather than failure and suicide in the dominant culture. And they defunded them under Abbott and Scullion, and, and, and I, it, it, to me, that was one of the worst things when you think of those causal pathways, because one of the outcomes from defunding those centres will be increased suicide rates. They don't get causal pathways. I don't know why. It's beyond an election cycle. Sorry, that's the, my cynicism. Okay. Apologies for that. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of time. We've had a number of questions that kind of relate to the current context that we're seeing today, if you've been watching uh, over the last couple of weeks with the news, looking at Black Lives Matters, looking at uh, Mr Floyd's death, also looking at the assault uh, by police officer on, on that young Aboriginal man in Sydney. Um, you know, could we, would, you, would you want to talk about the importance of these particular movements, but how we make sure that it's not just, as someone says here, a social media trend. Mm. Yeah, look, it, it's, it's um, you know, I think symptomatic of, of not addressing the issue in a meaningful way in the US. And, um, and you know, people just get to a boiling point and, and, uh, and it spills over. And, you know, there's, not condoning all the, the, the behaviours about, you know, looting and, and uh, destruction of property and so forth. There's a lot of really powerful, um, you know, silent protests and, and uh, peaceful protests happening over there. But if you have a look at the situation more broadly, a lot of it's got to do with the, the non-addressing of, of poverty and, and uh, creating an environment where people just feel helpless and hopeless and feel that they have to take issues into their own hands to see progress. And that's why, you know, if we can get the preventive health strategy up, you know, and, and, uh, and get adequate funding for it for a, a long duration. And, and that's one of the challenges we've got is, is making sure that, you know, policies and programs don't evolve around uh, a minister and, and the, their term in parliament or, or their term in the post or the, or the duration of a, parliamentary setting. But, you know, when I talked about the, the setting the closing the gap targets way back in, in 2006, it was a 25 year target. And that is a consistent approach, not the stop start stuff that goes on. Uh, in Australia, we, we're not quite, um, and I don't think we'll get to the, to the level of protest that we're seeing in the US. But what we do see is a lot of supportive protests going around. And, and a lot of that's because when we look at justice itself, um, justice reinvestment. They've played around with it, various governments, uh, but nobody's really embraced it in a way to say that this is going to work. Uh, and that justice reinvestment's about investing in people before they commit crimes. It's a preventative approach. And that's why uh, preventive health is so important um, because it's the downstream stuff that we're trying to address up front in, in that issue. A report that I was a member of, um, led by Justice Byers, an Aboriginal, our first Aboriginal judge, uh, on pathways to Indigenous incarceration, or pathways from Indigenous incarceration. And, um, you know, that, that report was tabled in December 2017. Um, it hasn't been reacted to, and it's probably one of the, the most seminal reports that we've seen on Indigenous incarceration. It is so comprehensive, 
and and it's so much good guidance for government but they pussyfoot around and they want to get hard on crime which is um you know that's not the way to go the way to go is to prevent crime being committed in the first place mm -hmm. and when you look at the uh, you know, the success down in Burke, the Burke community yeah. in New South Wales on justice reinvestment, that should be enough to say, yeah, let's roll it out everywhere because mm. it is working and not only in justice, but in health. We're seeing now, um, I think since the program's gone and we haven't seen any undersized birth weight babies, um, you know, they're all being 1500 grams and above, which is, you know, a phenomenal outcome. And that's because people were involved in, you know, the local Aboriginal people were involved. They developed the strategies. They worked with the police, with the council, with the health sector, with education and, and developing a pathway. Um, but, you know, the top down government deciding what's best for us just ain't going to cut it anymore. No. Fantastic. I agree. Um, after your comment, Fiona, we're going to have to wrap up, I fear. I'll be very quick. Um, please, no more Royal Commissions. No more Royal Commissions that are ignored. Um, isn't it interesting that we have so very few riots here in relation to the issues, maybe only 3% of the population, et cetera, but we've had Domaji on Palm Island, we had Elijah Doherty in, in, uh, in, uh, in Kalgoorlie, we had the Redfern riot around the little boy who was impaled on a fence after being chased by a policeman, 10-year-old boy. But, you know, 400 deaths in custody since the Royal Commission, and as Tom said, no implementation. Um, but... Uh, what isn't this just the most important uh, evidence now that we need a voice we need to take it almost out of the hands of governments who have failed time after time to implement the preventive strategies even though all the recommendations in all of the social justice commission reports and the royal commissions have said the same thing then an aboriginal voice so to me this is where we should almost take it as, as out of government and say, Aboriginal people need to be able to control their own destiny because they do have the solutions. But we need to partner with them, of course. We need to say, we need to say we're here if you need us to lobby or whatever, and we'll, we'll, we'll work with you. We'll walk with you across bridges <laughs> to, mm. to get there. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, given that we still have 141 participants, I think people still want to hear from you. So maybe I was a bit preemptive in thinking that we needed to wrap up. So I just want to ask you a, a bit of a question, uh, a little bit more about racism. How do you think we need to tackle racism in this country, particularly around, um, we obviously know what blatant racism is, but what about casual racism and microaggressions? Yeah. Well, for, for me, from my observations and Adam Goods raises it uh, very much when he talks about casual racism. And that is we've all got to be conscious of what we say and do and think. And, um, and you know, not be influenced by the very minority of shock jocks around there who uh, have got ulterior motives in what they say. They're not interested in the betterment of society. And, you know, what we've got to do is to be able to, to uh, hear, hear the voices of, of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and all of those minority peoples who are affected because, you know, we, 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 we experienced racism, but boy, I, I was the race discrimination commissioner for five years and, and, and there are a lot more other minority groups in the nation mm. who experience exactly what we experience and sometimes more often than what we do. And, um, you know, particularly women um, who wear hijabs and, um, uh, you know, and if you're a, uh, you know, it's a subtle racism uh, like, like, you know, if you're a black person, you have somebody tailing you and, and, um, and you know, you, you just, uh, when you go into a shop and it's always that, that assumption, they're going to commit a crime, let's try and prevent it instead of seeing them as a, another member of, of society and a, and a contributor. So, you know, we've got to be able to address it. We've got to make sure that, that it's, it's a two-way thing too, you know, that, that we've got to work with our people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to help keep them informed about developments and and to, you know and particularly our young and over fifty percent of our of our population uh, is under fourteen years of age. So we have got to start to work with our youth, hear our youth, and hear what they say a lot more um, uh, to give us some direction um, ourselves. And and uh, and that's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth. And there's there's a number of um, you know there's all all youth need to be heard a lot more than than what we're doing. And, and that's, you know, creating the forums to be able to do that and, uh, and encouraging. And, you know, for some of us older folk, we've got to, um, 
you know, create the opportunities by stepping aside or mentoring, encouraging people to step up, um, you know, and, and all of that, I guess, is down to empowerment and, and so that people can, 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 you know, be able to be resilient is what it's about because racism can have a really detrimental impact on, on a person's well-being and, and uh, psychology and, and psyche and, and so, you know, we've got to be able to support people, but also, you know, educate, educate a lot more that, that you know, you don't have to be fearful. You don't have to have these, um, you know, assumptions about people. That's the unconscious bias side of it. But, you know, that's from an Aboriginal uh, perspective and just my, my experience as, a, as the uh, Race Discrimination Commission. Mm. Oh, I, I, think, uh, I think we're never going to get rid of racism. I think mm. uh, every country's racist. Um, I hate it when people say Australia is the most successful multicultural country in the world. Who, who's judging, guys? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just... Uh, um, and I think Tom's absolutely right. Educate and legislate and call it out. Um, I don't see why we can't have a national strategy against racism. We have a national... Well, we haven't actually got a proper national strategy for obesity, but we have it for other things. And um, uh, But what, what's, what, what would be wrong about having a national strategy to combat racism in Australia. I, it wasn't until I saw both Adam Good's films that I knew anything about people like the, that Ch Sam Newman. Um, yeah. and, and, uh, and I hadn't, I'm not a football fan, so I didn't understand the whole thing. It was shocking to me that they were allowed to be on television and to be on radio saying the things they were saying. So legislation has got to stop that. It's not freedom of speech. It was blatant, yeah. ghastly racism. And I don't know why the AFL didn't step in and stop that booing uh, early, to stop the whole game and say, this is unacceptable. That would have been so powerful. But it didn't. It just sat there and everyone went boo, boo, boo to this. He could have suicided. We're lucky that he's such a strong man. I love Adam Goods. I think he's wonderful. But a national strategy to say this, and it, you know, how far away we are, are we from, from this racism that's so embedded and so on, to actually... The, the Unipingu comment about this wonderful opportunity we have as a nation to revel and, and, and uh, to uh, be in uh, 60,000 years, probably more, of Aboriginal culture um, and, and to understand all what that means. I mean, to me, that's where we ought to be because it is so important for us in this world now where we've gone the wrong way. We've over, uh, uh, you know, we've... we've uh, 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 taken everything out of the ground, we've destroyed the land, we've destroyed the many species, and here's a group of people who've got solutions about how you control the land and fires and all the rest of it, and also a way that you can live together in harmony and peace with that land. And to me, it's a wonder, I know I'm, you know, way, way off the, the beam here, but, and I'm sort of dreaming of a, a future that's going to be difficult to be because of the corporate conglomerates and the juggernauts we can't turn yeah. around. They're so powerful and they're so lobbying and the fossil fuel industry and all the rest of it. But wouldn't it just be great if for some reason we could actually start to turn that juggernaut around a bit? And I think people are starting to think that now after the pandemic, when everything slowed down. And maybe, just maybe, if we could have people with leadership who can push us in that way, it may be that we would actually be able to address this racism as well. Yeah. And, and Sam, I guess uh, uh, the thing that really resonates with me is the, the slogan that the Human Rights Commission uh, push out and that racism stops with me. And if mm. we're not perpetrators, then it will stop. Absolutely. Fantastic. And uh, just linking in with racism, there's been a couple of questions around the role of education, particularly embedding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander content into primary school education. Do you want to just look, have, have a chat about what you think that will do for reconciliation and, and reducing racism? Look, I, I think it's, uh, it's where we have to start. Um, anybody with an interest in this area needs to just hop onto the um, Reconciliation Australian website and, and uh, look at the Narragunna Wally program. And that's a program where we've worked across the nation with every jurisdiction's uh, board of studies and developed a curriculum that can be used in school. And it's a, a curriculum about Australian history, uh, uh, often with a an Aboriginal trust on a lens on it, um, and which is a bit like Cook and what, what um, you know, what, what we've been saying here with the, um, you know, the celebration, 250 year celebration 
of Cook and, and Alison Page's view that um, that's, that's widely shared um, is that we should be looking out and we should be looking, not Cook looking at us and saying, there's the Aboriginal people, but us saying, you know, we're looking out, hey, here's, here's a fella coming in uh, into our country. We've been here first. And, and so it's really the outward looking message about um, all of these issues. But yes, it is happening in schools. Uh, in some of the states, uh, there's a really strong move to uh, go beyond just the, the, the Narragunniwali curriculum, but to look at implementing Aboriginal languages in their schools or understanding who the local uh, Aboriginal people are and where Aboriginal languages are, are, um, are spoken, that they're able to, to use them. And we see some great, um, great work out there of, of, you know, and you, you see them on TV every so often where the kids are singing in language and, you know, and, um, and it, it, oh, a little plug, University of Canberra with our, our preschool out there, uh, all the kids, they all sing and do a welcome in Ngunnawal. And, and um, you know, it, it's fantastic and to see that and to know the pride that they say. And this is all, all kids. And, um, yeah, kids are our future, you know, and, and they're going to be the ones that drag a lot of us adults along in, on the right path. And uh, that's why we invest so heavily in, in trying to get uh, kids educated. I can just come in quickly. The, the other part of education, of course, with the general public is this fantastic uh, um, almost uh, you know, explosion of um, First Nations theatre, film, poetry, books. Um, as sport has a big role to play here. If the AFL took a leadership along with all the other sporting agencies, that would educate a lot of people. We've got all our museums and our art galleries. This Aboriginal art is already um, internationally renowned. Um, and I can remember the wonderful Bob Mazza, who was the greatest uh, satirist ever. Um, and he and uh, another historian sitting up naked on a, on a hilltop. Uh, looking out as the first fleet that came in and uh, turning to uh, a guy and saying, uh, in perfect English, I do think we need to review our immigration policy. Um, you know, humour, um, this, this will uh, give, take away this image of the Aboriginal people being uh, useless drunks in the gutter to being very, you know, creative, wonderful people who, um, whose culture is worth investigating. So I think there's a lot of educating we can do, but I'm, I think more theatre and films, books, poetry um, is, a, is a really good way to go, in addition to the school programs that Tom's mentioned. Mm. But we've got some brilliant, um, very, very clever uh, Aboriginal uh, people making all these things now, uh, you know, who are getting to Cannes and, and uh, you mm. know, it's really fantastic. Mm. Yeah, it's fantastic. And I think, yeah, and, you know, we should encourage people to, to also look at um, NITV. Yes, uh, you yes. Know, uh, uh, the, the Point or Living Black, these yes. sort of programs that really look at, at contemporary news and issues from mm. an Aboriginal trust and honour perspective. And that's a great way to, to get an understanding. And, and it's interesting if you look at mainstream media representation of, a, of an issue, and then you look at uh, the points analysis of it, you'll get two different perspectives sometimes. Uh, of the same issue, so so yeah, you know that, that's that's part of our own education, and uh, and sharing and learning, and you know if you tune into the the National Indigenous Radio Service, uh, which which you know a lot of good Indigenous talk back on those programs, so so they're around. Um, you know we just got to uh, be keen to seek them out and have a listen. But I think also Tom that a lot of NITV and a lot of National Indigenous Radio is. Uh, is listened to by First Nations. We need to get into the mainstream, including yes. the commercials. We need to get a lot more of this Aboriginal, wonderful Aboriginal culture, uh, humour and, uh, and uh, so on, uh, because that will then start to educate the people who would never tune into NITV. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, Fiona, can I just ask, we've had a participant ask for the reference for the quote from Mr Yunapingu. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, will you just go into the final report of the Referendum Council? And it's in the introduction given by um, uh, Pat uh, Anderson and uh, Liebler. Yeah. And Fantastic. it's about page hmm, three of the introduction, I think. And uh, I, I, I just have it on my desk all the time. I keep on, every time I give a talk now, I read, the, I read it because I think it's so very beautiful and it oh. just encapsulates everything that's wonderful I, I get very teary when I read it, but it, it, it encapsulates everything that's just wonderful 
about the opportunities we have, and if we don't take them, we're stupid, stupid idiots. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Now, uh, I am conscious of time. I'm, I'm sure you both have other things to do uh, because it is Reconciliation Week and just because both of you are unbelievably busy as it is. Uh, can I just ask you maybe to share some final thoughts on reconciliation uh, into the future? Tom? Okay. Um, well, from my side of it, I think we're, we're in a, um, a good space, um, you know, and, and we saw this through the recognised movement when we tried to, um, to get out, we canvassed the views of people across the nation. We had over 300,000 uh, people as friends of, of reconciliation. And, um, you know, and those numbers are, are equally high now um, uh, through reconciliation. Um, I think more and more people are, are keen to learn um, a lot more. And uh, yeah, look, I just encourage all, everybody, and I do it myself. I, I learn something new every day, you know, and um, and don't expect that an Aboriginal person or trusted on a person knows every single thing about Aboriginal trusted on affairs. Uh, very few of us do. No, that's a joke. But, uh, uh, you know, it's learning for all of us that we, uh, you know, but we have to take the time and the interest to learn. But I think reconciliation is in a, in a good place. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to recognise uh, Minister White for his support in, in continuing funding of Reconciliation Australia because we've got a, a long road ahead and until and until we can get equity and equality for all across all the sectors um, then the journey's not over we've got to continually work hard on this and um, and reconciliation is about equality and equity for all. Yeah I'd just like to go back to what Tom said at the beginning which is that Reconciliation isn't about Aboriginal people reconciling with Australians and the way that they've been treated. It's really about us. Um, it's us as Australians all together uh, acknowledging. And what an exciting path we can travel if we truly reconcile and really acknowledge. I think it's very exciting. And I think of all of the um, Aboriginal people that are now so successful in walking in two cultures. So they reconcile themselves. They, they, they're still strong in their Aboriginal culture because they know how important that is. And it, that's a challenge to do that. But you think of Bangara Dance Company. They keep going back to country because they know that will be the power that gives them the credibility and the trust of the people they're trying to represent in their beautiful dances. Well, it's the same. We could do this for everything. If everyone had the same kind of thoughts that we've been talking about today, so PHA has its, if everyone had this, I know I keep on dreaming these things, but then we would have, we, 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 we would have a, a very different situation. And, you know, it may be that we're getting there with all of these things um, so much more than, uh, what, 10 years ago, Tom? And oh. I don't think we're going backwards. I really don't. People say we're going back. I don't think so. Too many non-Indigenous, first, non-First Nations want now for us to be a better country in this area. Yes. And thank you very much again for, for having me on with Tom. I admire yeah, him. Yeah. Yes, uh, mutual. Yeah. I, great. If I could just sum up, I've been writing down some notes, scribbling away as fast as I could because you've both had a lot to say and it's been fantastic. But for me, when I think about the key messages that you have shared with us today, I think about the fact that both of you have talked about the 97%. So the non-Indigenous population really need to do the heavy lifting around reconciliation. And part of that heavy lifting is self-education and also working then with their other 97% to make sure that we are uh, calling out racism when we see it. We're actually acknowledging that it exists. Um, and both of you have talked about how while there has been some successes in the reconciliation process, we clearly have more to do. And Fiona, you specifically talked about the Uluru Statement and how that in particular is a way that we can demonstrate as a country uh, true reconciliation. And a number of people on the, on the questions, we, we haven't answered all of them, our apologies, have actually asked for resources. So Reconciliation Australia obviously has resources around this, yeah. but Reconciliation New South Wales has developed a toolkit to support people to actually go out and advocate and promote the Uluru Statement. So if that's something you're interested in, check out the toolkit on Reconciliation New South Wales websites. But if you are looking for resources around reconciliation, 
do make sure you check out Reconciliation Australia's website. Uh, you both also talked about how listening to Indigenous people and letting uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people lead the way is really important. And uh, there's a number of questions on the list we haven't gotten to around co-design and co-creation. And obviously, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander leadership is um, quite important. And I just want to note that in the leadership space, um, something like 60% of Aboriginal people are under the age of 30. Uh, so. Uncle Tom, when you called me young summer, I'm at the age of 39. Sometimes I don't feel young, sometimes, but compared to um, the years you have on me in terms of wisdom and experience, I am young. So we are grateful for you, both Fiona and Tom, to share your wisdom. But I also would like to reiterate that given how young our population is, we have wonderful elders, but we also need to be working with our young people. Because if we aren't working with our young people, then we certainly will not be hearing from the majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, and Thea Butler, who works for New South Wales uh, Reconciliation New South Wales, has put up a link in the chat around the Voice Treaty Truth Toolkit. So I just want to thank yeah. you again for giving up almost an hour and a half of your time. We know how busy you are. And I have to say, we've now got 108 people still on the line and we're 21 minutes over. It's a testament to how well received you are and how important people think your voice is. So thank you for joining us today. And on behalf of the Public Health Association, I'd like to say a big thank you from the board and also the staff. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And, uh, and thank you, listeners and participants, uh, you know, for, uh, for the questions and, and just listening. And, uh, you know, if we all go away with just taking a little bit out of what we've talked about, you know, we'll, we'll create a better place. Absolutely. And sorry, just to those that did have questions in there, particularly around resources, I think uh, I'm adding some work to the officers. Uh, already quite big workload, but I think we can start putting together a list of really good resources which might be able to support you answer some of those questions. So again, apologies we haven't if we haven't answered yeah. you today, but we will attempt over the next couple of weeks to come back to you. And, and there's a ton of them Summer. on the outright website. So. Yeah. And Summer, you've done a lovely, lovely job of yes. um, controlling us. <laughs> hey, look, you, to be honest with you, you guys didn't need any control and I'm just really grateful that uh, you have so much wisdom to share with us. So I'd like to sign off and again, a really big thank you and um, enjoy the rest of your day and week and year. Thank you, folks, and happy Reconciliation Week. Yep, from me too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, see ya.